magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and this is the unit focus video on Warwalkers. In these videos, I talk about what the unit is, its role on the table, and how to overcome obstacles to using it effectively. Warwalkers are light scout vehicles with a 10-inch move, a toughness of 7, a 3-up save, a 4-up invuln, 6 wounds, and then 2 objective control. At 110 points, they can take any two Eldari heavy weapons, including... The Bright Lance, Star Cannon, Scatter Laser, Eldari Missile Launcher, or Shuriken Cannon, and the two heavy weapons don't have to be the same weapons. You could throw a Bright Lance and a Star Cannon on there if you wanted to. Walkers are a highly competitive pick in part simply because they're efficiently pointed and they do three jobs well. They are a target elimination unit. They're good at that for reasons I'll get into in a moment. They are a trading unit because they are cheap enough that if you sacrifice them, it's not a big sacrifice. And they are a reasonable objective control unit uh, simply because they're actually surprisingly hard to destroy because of a special rule that they have. Uh, their power field makes them minus one to wound. So at toughness seven, that actually means that stuff that's even like strength six, multi-damage, weapons still is only wounding them on sixes and then really powerful anti-tank stuff like bright lances or blast cannons or whatever are still only wounding them on fours and with that invulnerable save even a really hard heading weapon has to hit and then has a 50 percent chance of failing to wound and then they have a 50 percent chance of saving and you could always i guess use a fate die and massed small arms fire is not effective against them again because of that minus one to wound on the power field. Uh, stuff is only going to be wounding them on sixes and then they have a pretty good saving throw. It's actually really hard to destroy one of these things without assigning significant resources to, to, to picking up the vehicle. And if you're assigning uh, significant resources to destroying your opponent's Warwalker, then you are not assigning those resources to picking up Wraith Guard, to killing the Avatar, to taking out a Falcon or whatever else. As a target elimination unit, the Walker is good uh, simply because Eldari heavy weapons are really good. Now, in practice, you are almost always going to want to put two Bright Lances on your Walker or Walkers. Uh, in part, this is because the Eldari detachment rule, as we already know, that gives you a reroll to hit and a reroll to wound, favors low rate of fire, high strength, high damage weapons. So you've got two Bright Lances uh, hitting on threes with a reroll at strength 12, minus 3 AP, D6 plus 2 damage. And then you've got a reroll to wound. So you're frequently going to be able to hit with both of these, wound with both of these, and... Uh, unless something has an invuln save, it's probably if it's in cover, it's gonna it's gonna save on a on a five up. But two bright lances is pretty good shooting, and then of course you can always use fate dice to do just flat eight damage with the bright lance, which is fabulous. At the very end, I'll discuss some other possible loadouts for the warwalker, but I really think that the bright lance is probably going to be your go-to pick. Pair of bright lances. An additional advantage that the Warwalker has is the ability to make a scout move before the game starts, a 9-inch scout move. Now, I especially like this because the deployment zone Eldar or are fragile. Part of playing Eldari is in the deployment phase of the game, showing your opponent nothing. You, you want to show your opponent nothing, except maybe like a lone operative, which they're never going to get into uh, range of. The fact that the walkers can make scout moves means that you can put them at the front of your deployment zone out in the open. They're not using up valuable real estate out of line of sight in your deployment zone and then move them out of line of sight before the game starts uh, just forward of your deployment zone on your half of the midfield, totally behind some uh, obscuring ruin, which is all ruins now. The scout move also means that they can help screen out uh, opponents' units that, that make a scout move themselves because scout moves can't finish within nine inches of enemy models. So like, I, I think you always want at least one unit 
in your list that advance deploys into the midfield. I for, that's going to be Rangers, right? Uh, you could use Scorpions, but I think the Rangers are more efficiently pointed. But then also having a Walker in your list, your Rangers can't be everywhere. There are there are going to be very few matchups in which this matters, but there are there are armies that have and have historically had pretty powerful scout move units like current uh, up until uh, Adeptus Mechanicus got its new codex it's that's happening they haven't been terribly scary but in previous editions their uh, scouting units have been and so so be, having your own stuff that can like run out in front of your army and make sure that if your opponent gets first turn they don't have a bunch of stuff more or less in your backfield is is useful but really the best thing about the scout move, again, is the ability to use cover without taking up space in uh, your backfield. Here's the other thing that I really like about the scout move. So if you've got a war walker uh, that starts just in front of your deployment zone and jumps into cover, uh, probably the only way that your opponent can get a beat on that first turn is to move something that's pretty fast, really deep into the midfield to get an angle on it. And if your opponent is doing that, then your war walkers will also, or your war walker will also be able to target that unit with overwatch fire. If you're a really new player, overwatch is a one CP stratagem that lets you interrupt your opponent's turn to shoot after they've moved a unit or declared a charge. And the catch with overwatch is you only hit on sixes, but one of the advantages to being an Eldari player, right, is you can use fate dice to automatically hit. Now you may only have a few sixes in your fate dice pool, but if you have a Farseer, once per player turn, you can treat any die as a six. And in tournament play, uh, typically the entire first floor of ruins that are in your deployment zone and face the opponent's side of the table are considered to be opaque. So no windows, no doors, totally opaque. And this means usually that you can position a Farseer uh, pretty close to the midfield in one of these ruins completely out of line of sight. It doesn't matter that the Farseer is in the building because with an opaque first floor, uh, the Farseer will not be visible. So you can make that nine inch scout move, probably have the, the Warwalker out of line of sight, but also close enough to the Farseer that the Farseer, because it's gotta be within 12 inches, right? The Farseer can enable uh, the Warwalker to use like a one on your fate die as a six and simply automatically hit with one of those bright lances with overwatch the second bright lance obviously is only going to hit on a six but you've also got your reroll for your detachment ability because that ability works every time a unit shoots or fights not just in the shooting phase or in the fight phase so you you, you might even hit with both bright lances uh, and then you have a reroll to wound on the one that you hit with so you stand a very high chance if you just spend the one cp on overwatch of blatting something with the bright lance now you can only spend one fate die uh per phase so you can't then guarantee that that bright lance does eight damage to the thing that's coming for it um but frankly d6 plus two damage is still a lot and there's a lot of stuff in your army that won't be able to use overwatch on first turn so it's not like it's going to be able to compete it's not like it's going to be competing with other stuff and the unit is cheap enough that having it out in front of your army uh, is just, it's fine. You're not, we're not really worried about that. Uh, then in the early game, you can have your Warwalker jump on a uh, midfield objective potentially. And again, with the minus one to wound and the invuln save and the pretty good toughness and saving throw, uh, it, it can be really resource intensive for your opponent to try to pick that model up. So either they have to yield the objective to you or they're not shooting your other stuff, which is great. Warwalkers also, because they can make that nine inch scout move, if you then get first turn, because they can then move another 10 inches, potentially you can get a bead with your Warwalker on something of your opponents that's really difficult to see, pretty far out of line of sight. Uh, some, I don't know, target indirect fire, target elimination tank or something. Um, and in that case, you probably want to use the fate die uh, to max out the damage. A, a single Warwalker with with a fate die to blow in the shooting phase is pretty is pretty scary. If, if you figure you're, the Warwalker is essentially moving 19 inches from where it started, and then uh, blasting something, that's pretty that's pretty good. 
you might even consider using the war walker to move block uh that's another option so it scouts nine then it moves 10 it shoots something and then on your opponent's turn it prevents your opponent's whatever it is big baddie from being able to move into the midfield You're, you may lose your warwalker but you can also then pull the overwatch trick on your opponent's turn you'll be far enough from the farseer at this point that you will need a natural six to auto hit on overwatch but nevertheless it's probably worth it because those bright lances hit really hard okay let's briefly talk about obstacles to using the warwalker well there's really only one and that's melee although the warwalker is unusually robust against enemy shooting attacks because of the power field because the power field does not apply in close combat suddenly it's quite killable also melee units dedicated melee units often have a lot of attacks they often have pretty good strength strength four or better and without the minus one to wound even a bunch of melee infantry that are only strength four or five are going to be wounding it on fives with volume of attacks they can probably destroy it if it's a multi-damage attack of any kind or like a big monster that hits pretty hard. Uh, the, the invulnerable save might carry you through, but suddenly it's it's not it's no longer resource intensive to eliminate. Or if the walker simply gets swamped with uh, something like Hormigants or something. The, the, you know, the Bright Lances can fire in close combat at minus one to hit with the big guns never tire rule, but that's not going to help against Hormigants. The obvious solution to this is do not get into close combat with your Warwalker. The single worst thing you can do with the Warwalker is to put it on a midfield objective early in the game, kind of on your side of the field, uh, that will make it possible for an opponent's dedicated melee unit with better objective control to make a move or if it can advance and charge, uh, to, to essentially to reach that objective that it would not have otherwise been able to reach and destroy your Warwalker that it would not have otherwise your opponent would not have otherwise been able to pick up. That's the only just straight up play error that you can, I think, easily make with this thing. That's a true blunder is to use the scout move and the turn one move to, to essentially give your opponent a free move onto an objective in the midfield with a dedicated melee unit that can either tie up or destroy the walker. Just don't do it. Don't do that. In order to avoid this, you need to know what your opponent's units can do, how far they can move, whether they can advance and charge, and just don't don't set that up for your opponent. In that kind of a matchup, you may want to play more conservatively with your Warwalker. It's still going to be... You, you, I'm sure you have a lot of stuff in your list because we're Eldar. We, we excel at killing everything. Uh, you probably have a lot of stuff in your list that can kill your opponent's dedicated melee units, and you may want to play conservative with your Walker until those are off the table, and then you bring it out and control objectives with it. There are certain matchups in which the Walker might actually end up being more of a late-game piece. So against something like a Tyranid invasion fleet list, you use the Bright Lances on the big monsters and you don't invite any charges of scuttling horrors across the battlefield. Just be careful. If you come up with uh, against an enemy with really good shooting, you can also, I, I mean, I guess potentially that's an issue. Uh, there might be rare circumstances in which it makes sense to use lightning fast on this thing. So your opponent's hitting on four up, not wounding on better than four up, and then you have a four up save that's really good. But most of the time, you're probably going to want to use lightning fast on something else. But not always. I I would say one, one in every three games or so, I use it on my Warwalker. So this is just a great tool for its, for its durability, for its target elimination. Uh, for the tricks it lets you pull, it has nice synergy with the Farseer. It's probably not competing with anything else early for that Overwatch fire. And it's disposable, right? I mean, these are just such useful... You're never going to be sorry you took a Warwalker. I don't think they're auto-includes. Uh, there's certainly lots of lists doing really well at GTs that don't include a Warwalker or two. That said, there are plenty of plenty of very high-performing Eldari lists that do include a Warwalker, so I do think you know this is a highly competitive unit. But it's not like uh, you're being silly if you leave it home. It's just, it's very good. In terms of uh, units that it may be competing with for a, a place in your list that are similarly costed and may also uh, tempt you. I think we really have three. Uh, it's the Hornet, the Void Weaver, and uh, the Heavy Weapons Platform, the Support Weapon, which is obviously going to be a D-Cannon. 
these are also uh, sort of like light vehicles with significant firepower that may be sort of filling a similar place in the list, except I don't I don't really think that they do. Uh, of those three, I think only the Void Weaver really gives the the Warwalker a run for its money, although depending on your list, there are reasons to think about uh, the other two or uh, the other three. There are reasons to think about all of them potentially, but I think the, the for most lists, I think the Walker is going to be the strongest candidate. So the Hornet is uh, a light, very light skiff with a 14 inch move. It's toughness seven, like the Walker, three up save like the Walker. It has eight wounds instead of six. And it also can have two bright lances and therefore pull the same overwatch trick. It also, it doesn't have the, the durability thing, but or the scout move, but it's faster and it has uh, this lightning assault ability when it moves over an enemy unit, not including monsters and vehicles, so infantry or bikes, you roll 66 and for each four up you do a mortal wound and it's 10 points cheaper. That's really good. There's no doubt that uh, Hornets are good. Oh, you don't have to give the Hornet two Bright Lances, it's just you should if, if that's what you're running. Uh, the reason that I like the walker a little bit better, honestly, the the scout move, the ability to not use up space in your own deployment zone, uh, I, that's huge. The, the ability to be out there before the game starts. And then the power field. Guys, the, the, that minus one to wound is crazy. The walker ends up being considerably more durable than the hornet, which also simply doesn't have an invulnerable save. As such, the, the hornet is not an ability can't control an objective the way a walker can it's not target it's not resource intensive for an opponent to eliminate in the way that a war walker is theoretically it can do slightly more damage than a walker because of that lightning assault ability except practically even with a 14 inch move in order to move over an enemy unit the opponent you're, you're either moving the thing into the midfield and keeping it totally out of line of sight turn one and then going for it in, in which case this is definitely like a one and done trading unit and which is fine but it's it's unlikely to be flying over anything particularly choice and really uh dumping out the mortal wounds and and frankly the walker could have done the walker could have done a similar job maybe even faster because it's got the scout move so it doesn't have to like get into position turn one and then go for it the extra like four inches of movement that the Hornet have I, has, I don't think are terribly significant with respect to that. So if you take the Hornet, you're giving up the robust durability, which gives you an ability to control objectives. Uh, you're giving up the fact that it's a resource sink for your opponent to eliminate. You give up the scout move and the advantage in your deployment zone. You get a little extra mobility and a little extra damage output against infantry. Uh, and I just don't think that that's a big enough win to take the Hornet instead. The support weapon with uh, the D cannon has the advantage of being an indirect fire uh, weapon that hits really hard, right? A D cannon has D3 shots hitting on threes, strength 16, minus four, D6 plus two damage. It does devastating wounds on sixes. It's a heavy weapon. So even though you're at minus one to hit for being indirect, if you don't move it, you're still hitting on threes. Uh, it's a blast weapon. Like that's really good. A D cannon in your backfield will give you more control in the midfield within 24 inches of that D cannon. And again, if you're playing with tournament terrain rules, which most people do, they're designed to be more fair. Uh, and you have those opaque first floors, uh, in the terrain that's in your deployment zone, you can get that D cannon pretty close, probably to the front of your deployment zone and just sort of like reach into a good deal of the midfield, which is great. Uh, most players are running either 10 Wraith Guard with the cannons or the Avatar of Cain, both of which are big midfield bully units, and therefore just finding that they really don't need the, the extra fire in the midfield. Uh, the sport weapon's not bad. It's just like you probably have other stuff in your army that's doing that well anyway. But if you don't, if you're running a non-standard list and you need a deterrent, because that's largely what the D cannon is, is a deterrent, it can be great for that. It does not do the same job that the Warwalker does. It's a, just a very different kind of a unit because it's got a three inch move. Uh, it used to be faster in, in other editions. You're not really repositioning this thing. 
maybe once, you know, you make an advanced move with it, but it's largely where it starts the game. So again, it's not going to, it's not going to help you. It's not going to jump on an objective. It's not going to move block. It's not a training piece. And it's definitely not doing overwatch fire with which both the Hornet and the Walker can do. And with the fate dice, I really think you want something in your list that's going to do it's going to be making use of the ability to just hit with an incredibly powerful weapon on your opponent's turn also. And that's not the D cannon uh, because indirect fire is no longer eligible for Overwatch in 10th edition. And then the last alternative would be uh, a Void Weaver, which some people are running in lists that are podiuming at GTs. It's a, it's a great unit. It too is a light vehicle. It's a skiff with a 14 inch move, toughness six instead of seven, four up invulnerable save, six wounds, two objective control like the Warwalker, but it has better shooting. You're giving up the T7 and the minus one to wound, but you're getting a better better damage output. So uh, the Void Weaver comes with two Shuriken cannons, which are good. Um, and then in addition, you get either the Prismatic Cannon or the Void Weaver Haywire Cannon. Uh, the Prismatic Cannon has a 36 inch range, which makes me like it better. It can either do a dispersed pulse, uh, so 2d6 shots, blast, hitting on threes, strength four, no AP, it's like good against Termagants, or you do the focused lances, in which case it fires two shots, 36 inches, hits on threes, strength 12, minus three, flat four damage. Flat four is pretty good. That's not as hard hitting as two bright lances but the warwalker doesn't also have two shuriken cannons uh if you're worried about vehicles in your meta or in your your list just doesn't have a lot of anti-vehicle which seems kind of unlikely in an eldar list but you could give it the void weaver haywire cannon this thing's pretty cool uh it fires three shots now because it's anti-vehicle four uh, and it has devastating wounds. On a four up to wound, it just automatically does three damage to its target, which also means you can use like a fate die roll of a four. So you're not using one of your best ones to just automatically do three wounds to a vehicle. And again, I think that if you're running, a, usually lists that run void, void weavers have a couple of them. Uh, if the, the void weaver haywire cannon or the 36 inch range prismatic cannon are part of your like, overall hard target elimination plan maybe maybe you need the void weaver instead but i think if we're just going pound for pound on what can the what can the unit do for you again the void weaver really is primarily doing target elimination it's not even with the four up invuln it's not that durable but and it, it's taken up real estate in your backfield so like with those other options the warwalker is giving you the scout move not competing for real estate extra durable, therefore can contest objectives and is resource intensive for an opponent to eliminate. So I just think it's a great unit. I think it's fabulous. And I do think in the majority of lists, it's going to be a better pick than these other similarly pointed light vehicles that might compete with it. Uh, lastly, we'll just talk other potential loadouts. Uh, I really, really think you probably just want the twin bright lances. The only possible alternative loadout i can maybe imagine uh suddenly marines and chaos space marines are doing way better there might be some kind of argument for a pair of star cannons and a heavy infantry heavy meta because a pair of star cannons will put out four shots and they'll hit on threes and they'll wound t4 infantry on twos and they've it's got minus three ap flat two damage so it just picks them up uh the reason that i think even even in such a meta probably you're better with the bright lances is that playing in a chaos space marines it, the, pro, the your problem is not that you can't kill legionnaires and, and noise marines generally the problem is uh the chosen which have three wounds and the terminators which have three wounds and the possessed which have three wounds in which case you're just better off with the bright lances which can also kill the forge fiends and yes a pair of scatter lasers is really good into like a horde army but uh we don't have problems killing infantry you don't you don't need scatter lasers for that that's something that your uh warp spiders your swooping hawks your shatter specters or, or one of your scoring units multitasks into and the game is still pretty monster vehicle and heavy infantry heavy overall so i think you want the bright lenses 
So there it is. Uh, I think War Walkers are fabulous if you own one and haven't been putting it on the table. I think you should think about putting it on the table. If you don't own one, it's a fun thing to add to your collection. They look cool. They're tactically useful. And they can fit in just about any list. If you have your own ideas about how to use War Walkers, I hope that you'll leave those in the comments below. If you have not liked the video, I hope that you will like it. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe. I would, I would love to have another subscriber. And if you're feeling uh, especially generous or you just want to connect with me more personally because you've been listening to these videos for months and are starting to feel weirdly uh, like my voice is familiar, then you could consider becoming a Patreon, which I would appreciate. My Patreons have early access to some content and access to my Discord, which I will link in the video description. The Patreon, not the Discord. You have to become a Patreon to join the Discord. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Best of luck with your space elves. I hope to be back again with something new soon.